CS407 Numerical Analysis, Section 10.1 Random Numbers. So we begin this chapter, as with all chapters, with a motivational example. And here we have a highway engineer who wants to simulate the flow of traffic for a proposed design of a major freeway intersection. Uh, the information that is obtained through the simulation. Uh, will then be used to determine the capacity of the storage lanes in which the cars must slow down to yield the right of way. Uh, the intersection has the form shown in the lower right hand figure and various flows, cars per minute, can be postulated at the points where the arrows are drawn. By writing and running the simulation program, the engineer can study the effect of different speed limits, determine which flows lead to saturation, for example bottlenecks, and so on. Obviously this section also discusses some techniques for constructing such programs. The picture in the lower left is the Davison Freeway in Detroit, Michigan, and it's from Wayne State University's archives. Davison Freeway was the first urban freeway constructed in the United States, and it's approximately five and a half miles long. Davison Freeway was built between 1941 and 1942, and due to the war was opened in late 1942. Uh, Upon its completion time, travel time to and from Detroit improved from approximately 15 minutes to around 3 to 4 minutes after the expressway was open. And so the first urban freeway in the United States was born. Now, if you look at this, you can see that that's a pretty narrow uh, exit lane. Uh, over the years, they didn't maintain this very much and it began to deteriorate. So in the 1990s, it was closed for a $45 million reconstruction project. At that time, the freeway still had its original concrete surface from 1944, with three lanes in each direction with a narrow space for passing. There were no shoulders on the side. And there was a small, you can see it there, grassy uh, median. Construction on the refurbishment lasted over a year, and the freeway opened, reopened in 1997. Today, it actually has four wider lanes and it has a new exit. It also has shoulders and uh, new bridges which improved uh, safety for motorists and it also provided access to the city of Highland Park. So this chapter differs from most of the others in its point of view. Instead of addressing clear-cut mathematical problems, it attempts to develop methods for simulating complex processes or phenomena. If the computer can be made to imitate an experiment or a process, then by repeating the computer simulation with different data, we can draw statistical conclusions. In this type of approach, the conclusions may lack a high degree of mathematical precision, but they'll still be sufficiently accurate to enable us to understand the process or phenomenon being simulated. We'll give particular emphasis to problems in which the computer simulation involves an element of chance. The whimsical name of Monte Carlo methods was applied some years ago by mathematician Stanislaw M. Ulam, from, who lived from 1909 to 1984, to this way of imitating reality by a computer. Since chance of randomness is part of the method, we begin with the elusive concept of random numbers. So consider a sequence of real numbers x1, x2, etc., all lying in the interval 0, 1. Expressed informally, the sequence is random if the numbers seem to be distributed haphazardly through the interval, and if there seems to be no pattern in the progression. For example, if all the numbers in the decimal form begin with the digit 3, then the numbers are clustered in the subinterval. x goes between 0 0.3 and 0 0.4, and they're not randomly distributed in 0, 1. If the numbers are monotonically increasing, they're also not random. If each xi is obtained from its predecessor by a simple continuous function, then the numbers are not random, even though they might appear to be. A precise definition of randomness is actually quite difficult to formulate, and if you're interested in looking at um, some uh, attempts at that, uh, there's a book by Chaitlin that's referenced in, uh, the, in our text that uh, looks at this and relates it to the complexity of computer algorithms. So it seems best, at least in introductory material, to accept intuitively the notion of random sequence of numbers in an interval and to accept that certain algorithms for generating sequences are more or less random. So most computer systems have random number generators, which are procedures that produce either A, a single random number, or B, an entire array of random numbers with each call. We call such a procedure random. The reader can use random number generators available on his or her computing system, uh, one available within the computer language being used, or one of the generators described uh, 
below. For example, random number generators are contained in mathematical software systems such as MATLAB, Maple, Mathematica, C, C++, and C Sharp, and many other languages. These random number procedures return one or an one or an array of uniformly distributed pseudo-random numbers in the unit interval 0, 1, depending on whether the argument is a scalar, variable, or an array. A random C procedure restarts or queries the pseudo-random number generator. The random number generator can produce hundreds or thousands of pseudo-random numbers before repeating itself, at least theoretically. For the problems in this chapter, we'll use a routine to provide random numbers uniformly distributed in the interval 0, 1. That's an open interval. A sequence of numbers is uniformly distributed in the open interval 0, 1 if no subset of the interval contains more than its fair share of numbers. In particular, the probability that an element x drawn from the sequence falls within the subinterval a to a plus h should be h, and hence independent of the number a. Similarly, if pi is a point xi and they are random points in the plane uniformly distributed in some rectangle, then the number of these points should fall inside a small square area k should depend only on k and not on where the square is located inside the rectangle. Random numbers produced by computer code cannot be truly random because the manner in which they are produced is completely deterministic. That is, no element of chance is actually present. But the sequences that are produced by these routines appear to be random, at least to our eyes. And they do pass certain tests for randomness. Some authors prefer to emphasize this point by calling such computer-generated sequences pseudo-random numbers. Let's take a look at how to program one of these uh, random number routines. So, if you want to uh, program a random number generator, then the one on this screen should be satisfactory, provided you have a machine with 32-bit word length. Uh, this simple algorithm generates n random numbers, x1, x2, all the way to xn, uniformly distributed in the open interval 0, 1. Here, all the L sub i's are integers in the range from 1 to 2 to the 31 minus 1. The integer L0 is called the seed for the sequence and is selected as any integer between 1 and the Mersenne prime 2 to the 31 minus 1. A fast normal random number generator can be written in only a few lines of code. An external function procedure to generate a new array of pseudorandom number generators per call could be based on the following pseudocode. To allow for adequate representation of numbers involved in a procedure random, it must be written by using double or extended precision for use on a 32-bit computer. Otherwise, it will produce ran non-random numbers. Recall that here and elsewhere, n mod m is the remainder when n is divided by m. So, for example, 44 mod 7 is equal to 2. 7 goes into 44 6 times. 42 is subtracted from 44 is 2, so the 44 mod 7 is 2. When m divides n evenly, we have n mod m is equal to 0. Let's look at two other pseudo-random number generator algorithms. Algorithm 1, and you may have seen this one in uh, the discrete math class. We initialize four values x0, x1, x2, x3, and c to random values based on the value of the seed. Uh, we let s equal the following and compute xn is equal to s mod 2 to the 32, and C is the floor, S divided by 2 to the 32. This one is actually denoted as the mother of all random number generators, and this was invented by George uh, Marsaglia. Here's Rand in Unix and how it works. Initialize X0 to a random number based on the value of a seed. Compute Xn plus 1 is equal to uh, 11035152456 xn plus 12345 and modulus at 2 to the 31. You can get a lot of these routines from the following websites. Agner.org and GNU.org also has them. Now these algorithms are suitable for some applications, but they may not produce high quality randomness, and so they probably wouldn't be suitable for um, applications requiring accurate statistics or in cryptographics. On the internet, you can actually find a lot of new and improved pseudo-random number generators, which are designed for fast generation of high-quality random numbers with colossal periods and with special distributions. 
So a few words of caution about random number generators and computing systems are needed. The fact that the sequences produced by these programs are not truly random has already been noted. In some simulations, the failure of randomness can lead to erroneous conclusions. Here are three points to remember. One, the algorithms of this type illustrated here by random and the ones that we discussed previously produce periodic sequences. That is, the sequences eventually repeat themselves. The random number generator is used to produce random points in n-dimensional space. These points lie on a relatively small number of planes or hyperplanes. The individual digits that make up random numbers generated by routines such as random are not, in general, independent random digits. So let's take a look at some examples. So here's some pseudocode to compute and print 10 random numbers. Um, mathematical software such as MATLAB, Maple, and Mathematica have collections of random number generators with various distributions. Um, for example, we can generate uniformly distributed pseudo-random numbers in the interval 0, 1. Moreover, they are particularly useful for plotting and displaying random points generated within regions in 1, 2, and 3 dimensional space. The results from running this routine are at least one set of results because um, your results will probably be different. It produces the following set of points. What we can do is we can check this. And as a course check of the random number generator, we can compute a long sequence of random numbers and determine what portion of them lie in the interval 0 to 1 half. The answer should be somewhere in the neighborhood of 50%. Of course, we'll need to tabulate the results, so here's some pseudocode to do that and carry out the experiment. In this pseudocode, a sequence of 1,000 random numbers is generated. Along the way, the current proportion of numbers less than one half is computed to every 1,000th step, and then at multiples of 1,000. Some of the computer results of the experiment are 49.5, 50.2, 51, and 50.625 percent. Not bad. The experimental distribution described on the last slide can be interpreted as a computer simulation of tossing a coin. A single toss corresponds to the selection of a random number x in the interval 0, 1. We arbitrarily associate heads with the event 0 is less than x is less than 1 half and tails with x lying between 1 half and 1. 1,000 tosses of the coin corresponds to 1,000 choices of random numbers. The results show the proportion of heads that result from the repeated tossing of the coin. Since turnabout is fair play, random numbers can also be used to simulate coin tossing as well. Observe that, uh, at least in this experiment, reasonable precision is attained with only a moderate number of random numbers. Repeating the experiment uh, 10,000 times has only a marginal influence on the precision. Of course, theoretically, if random numbers were truly random, the limiting value is the number of random numbers increases. Used increases without bound would be exactly 50%. In practice, in this pseudocode and others in the chapter, all of the random numbers are generated initially, stored in an array, and used later in the program as needed. It's an efficient way to obtain these numbers because it minimizes the number of procedure calls, but it does come at the cost of storage space. If memory space is at a premium, for example, an embedded system, the call to the random number generator can be moved closer to inside the loop so the call returns a single random number with each call instead of an array of them. Now we consider some basic questions about generating random points in various geometric configurations. Assume that the procedure random is used to determine a random number r in the interval 0, 1. If uniformly distributed random points are needed in a, b, then basically what we can do is we can map x to b minus a times r plus a, and that will put them in the open interval a, b. We want random integers in the set 0, 1 through n. We basically take n plus 1 multiplied by r and cast that to an integer and map it into i. And for random numbers between, from j to k, with j being less than k, we take k minus j plus 1 multiplied by r, add j, and then convert that to an integer and assign it to i. There are other manipulations that can be done, such as obtaining the first four digits in a random number by repeatedly multiplying by 10. Pseudocode routine for that is shown on page 486 of the seventh edition. Now turn our attention to the uses of the pseudocode for random. 
So consider the problem of generating 1,000 random points uniformly distributed inside the ellipse x squared plus 4y squared is equal to 4. One way to do this is to generate random points in the rectangle where x is, lies between minus 2 and 2 and y lies between minus 1 and 1 and we discard those that don't lie inside the ellipse. That's precisely what this pseudocode does. Uh, to be less wasteful, we might think that we could force the absolute value of y to be less than one-half times 4 minus x squared, as in the following pseudocode. As the title of this routine indicates, uh, we do get some erroneous results from this routine. Basically, the second set of pseudocode does not produce uniformly distributed points inside the ellipse, as shown on the right-hand side. The figure on the right is non-uniform and basically produced by the modified routine. You can see the difference, particularly on the outer edges here. But it is a bit subtle, particularly as we're doing this as a video lecture. So let's look a little bit more in depth. To be convinced of the fact that it's uh, a bit erroneous, we consider two vertical strips taken inside the ellipse. The points generated by the second program tend to be clustered at the left and the right extremities of the ellipse in the figure. But if each strip is a width h, then approximately 1,000 times h divided by 4 of the random points lie in each strip because the random variable x is uniformly distributed in minus 2 to 2. With each x, the corresponding y is generated by the program so that x, y is inside the ellipse. But the two strips shown should not contain the same number of points because they don't have the same area. Another example, uh, for the same reasons the following pseudocode does not produce uniformly distributed random points in the circle x squared plus y squared is equal to 1. In this pseudocode, 2 pi times ri2 is uniformly distributed in 0, 2, and ri1 is uniformly distributed in 0, 1. However, in the transfer from polar to rectangular coordinates, the uniformity is lost. The random points uh, end up being strongly clustered near the origin of the uh, circle. Random number generator produces a sequence of numbers that are random in the case in the sense that they are uniformly distributed over a certain interval, such as 0, 1. And it's not possible to predict the next number in the sequence from knowing the previous ones. One can increase the randomness of such a sequence by adding a suitable shuffle for them. The idea is to fill an array with consecutive numbers from the random number generator, and then use the generator again to choose at random which of the numbers in the array is to be selected as the next number in the new sequence. The hope is the new sequence is more random than the original one. For example, a shuffle can remove any correlation uh, between near successors of numbers in the sequence. Uh, the authors recommend flowers from 1995 for a shuffling procedure that can be used with a random number generator. It's particularly useful when uh, computers have a smaller uh, word length. Next, testing. So there are statistical tests that can be performed on a sequence of pseudo-random numbers. While such tests do not certify the randomness of a sequence, they're particularly important in applications. For example, they're useful in choosing between different random number generators, and it's comforting to know that the random number generator being used has passed such a test. Now, situations exist when a random number generator is useful, even though it doesn't pass the rigid test for true randomness. For example, if you're doing random matrices for testing some linear algebra code like you did previously in the class or in CS450, then strict randomness is probably not that important. On the other hand, strict randomness is essential in Monte Carlo integration and other applications. In these cases in which strict randomness is important, it's recommended that one use a machine with large word size and random number generator with known statistical characteristics. Quasi-random or low discrepancy Sequences are constructed from a uniform given coverage of an area or volume while maintaining a reasonably random appearance, even though they are not in fact random. The authors conclude this section with a brief history of prime numbers. Since having prime numbers and random number routines and other applications is of critical importance. I recommend Howard Eve's History of Mathematics for a great discussion on prime numbers. 
Next time we'll look at estimation of areas and volumes by Monte Carlo techniques.